Welcome to Call on Congress 2020. Apologies for any technological delay, but we are here and we ask you to bear with us throughout the entirety of our programming today. I'm Aubrey Thalen and I'm Fight Colorectal Cancer's Advocacy Manager, and I'm here with our Director of Advocacy, Molly McDonald. We hope everyone is doing well and settled in because we have a great day of programming planned for you all. So welcome everyone. We know that this event looks different than it has in the past, but again, we appreciate you bearing with us and being flexible, flexible as we turn Call on Congress into a virtual event. So we will absolutely miss being able to see everyone in person, but we're so excited that we can still get together virtually um, and expand Call on Congress to even more people. Um, I know for many of you, you've been to Call on Congress before, um, but for many others, this might be your first call on Congress and maybe even your first introduction to Fight CRC. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. So Fight CRC is a patient organization, but we're also a community and a family of advocates focused on a cure for colorectal cancer. Um, we fight to cure colorectal cancer and serve as relentless champions of hope for all affected by this disease through informed patient support, impactful policy change, um, and through breakthrough research efforts. So to talk a little bit about those three pillars, um, you're obviously gonna learn a lot about what we do in advocacy to today, but we really work to empower advocates and engage policymakers at the state and federal level um, to increase, us, increase access to colorectal cancer prevention, ensure access to high quality care for patients and their family, and support the development of new treatments and cures. And so Call on Congress is really our cornerstone advocacy event. Uh, and like I said, you'll learn a lot more about that today. We also have an incredible patient education team that provides medically reviewed educational support for patients and their loved ones um, through all stages of their journey. So we have an amazing me medical advisory board that reviews all of our educational material. And we offer it in print, online, and also through, lives, through live events such as webinars and podcasts. Um, and finally, research is another critical part of the work we do. Our team stays on top of the latest developments, and Fight CRC brings together scientists, nonprofits, government agencies um, to fund breakthrough research with the most impact. And so you'll learn a little bit about that later today as well. Um, I also wanted to quickly introduce you to some of the team who will be helping us out today. Um, so, as Aubrey mentioned, I have Aubrey here with me today in Washington, D.C. And then we also have our Director of Communications, Nancy Levesque. And then we have a lot of our team online as well. So we have Andrew Wartman, our Community Engagement Man Manager and the third member of our advocacy team, um, along with Elizabeth Fisher, our Project Manager, Reese Garcia, our Research Advocacy Manager, and Sharon Worrell, our Patient Education Manager, um, who are all on social media uh, monitoring your questions or um, any feedback that you have. And so make sure to say hello to them and, and shoot any questions you may have to them on social media. Or feel free to email us at advocate at fightcrc.org. So, and the rest of our team is online and on social media cheering us on, and it's truly an amazing crew, and we really couldn't do this without them, so we're so grateful to the entire team. Um, we also couldn't do this without support from our amazing sponsors. Uh, they, too, have been incredibly flexible and supportive um, as we have changed to a virtual format and, and all the challenges and that comes with that. Um, so we are incredibly grateful for them, and, and so we'd you know, like to just take a moment to thank our premier sponsors, Exact Sciences and Merck, our platinum sponsors, Genentech and No Shave November, our silver sponsors, Quicken Loans, Turtle Beach and Foundation Medicine, our bronze sponsors, Epigenomics, um, our breakout session sponsors, um, Bristol Myers Squibb, and also the Barbara Majeski Foundation, Renee Caldwell, and Daniel Bloomgarden. Again, we're incredibly grateful for all of you for helping us make this happen. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it back over to Aubrey, who's gonna give you a brief overview of what we can expect today. Yes, so we're just going to talk over briefly who's going to speak when, when you can expect breaks, and just in general, what to expect. So we'll start off our day with a panel with the big players of the federal government that play a role in fighting colorectal cancer. 
the Centers for Disease Control, Department of Defense peer-reviewed cancer research program, the National Cancer Institute, and the Food and Drug Administration all graciously allowed us to have someone come and speak with us today about what they do to impact colorectal cancer. We then move on to a deep dive on our policy priorities, or ASKS, which we say on the Hill, uh, which will help you advocate throughout the year and especially tomorrow with our virtual Hill Day. The final panel contains representatives from the National Cancer Institute, and they are experts on early age onset colorectal cancer, as well as and Andrea Andy Dwyer, who helps us out in relation to research. We will be talking about what Fight CRC has been doing over the past years to forward this effort. Finally, we will end with our Sunday Share Online. So make sure to join on social media if you haven't already, and make sure to share your story with us. We'll have two 15-minute breaks scheduled in during the session, so feel free to go to the bathroom, get some snacks or refreshments, and those will be happening after the first panel, ending around 1.30 p.m., and after Molly's, pan Ma Molly's presentation. And we, we want you to really make sure to engage with us online during those periods as well. On Monday, we'll have our virtual Hill Day, which we are very excited about. And we will, be, we will be sending out emails tomorrow that make it easy to take action and engage with your lawmakers uh, on funding that you really care about, which is colorectal cancer prevention and research. So make sure to watch your inbox then. Lastly, we just want to thank one last time all of our speakers that came here today online virtually and our moderator that came here as well virtually or came here as well in person. Uh, and we really want to say that we handpicked this year's speakers with you in mind. Granted, we had to switch to a virtual format, but we really want these panels to be discussion based and we're hoping to get some real information out of them both in their presentations and from your questions. So make sure to submit those. Breakout sessions that we had scheduled previously for call on Congress will be coming out in the future as webinars. So look for those as the year progresses. All right, virtual call on Congress 2020, let's do this. Mm -hmm. um, so first up today, we have our panel called, We Are In This Together, the latest from the big players. So during this panel, you'll hear from leaders at government agencies and programs that are at the forefront of colorectal cancer research and prevention. Um, and these are, again, are the programs that we will be advocating for during our virtual Hill Day tomorrow. And so as Aubrey, sa Aubrey said, we are so excited to have with us in person here today, Danielle Leach, Chief of Community and Government Relations of the National Brain Tumor Society. Danielle is responsible for ensuring brain tumor patients and caregivers are empowered with quality information, support and resources, and advancing research and quality of life through advocacy. Danielle has held leadership, leadership positions at the St. Baldrick's Foundation, American Cancer Society, Ovarian Cancer, National Alliance and Strain Cancer Prevention Center, and has also led several public policy initiatives related, related to childhood cancer and funding. Danielle is a dedicated volunteer and grassroots advocate for cancer and children's issues. She's the founder of the Mason Leach Superstar Fund at the American Childhood Cancer Organization in memory of her son, Mason, who died of pediatric brain cancer in 2007. We are so grateful that she could be here in person. She has an amazing um, depth of experience in the advocacy space and has a lot of great insight of, of how we can move the needle in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So we're so grateful to her and we'll turn it over to her shortly. Um, on the panel today, we will also hear from um, Dr. Lisa Richardson, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Dis Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. Dr. Lisa Richardson is responsible for providing leadership and direction for all scientific policy, um, scientific policy and programmatic issues related to four national programs. The Colorectal Cancer Control Program, which is of course what we care about particularly, the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, and the National Program of Cancer Registries. She oversees a well-developed research agenda that includes the National Cancer Prevention and Control Network. Dr. Richardson has authored and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles on breast cancer treatment, patterns of care, skin cancer, health policy, access to cancer care, systems of care, health disparities, and racial discrimination. So again, another 
person with great experience that you're going to learn a lot from. We'll also hear from Dr. Donna Kimbark, who's the program manager for the Department of Defense Peer Reviewed Cancer Research Program, another priority that we'll be advocating for um, to the Hill tomorrow. Dr. Kimbark received her PhD in molecular pharmacology and cancer therapeutics from the State University of New York at Buffalo, Roswell Park Cancer Division in 1996. Um, Following postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Kimbark worked in the biotechnology sector before joining the congressionally directed medical research programs in 2002 as a science officer in the breast cancer research program. Dr. Kimbark has managed research funding programs for autism, multiple sclerosis, sclerosis cancer, and bone marrow failure systems syndromes. Excuse me. Um, we will also hear from. Dr. Meg Mooney, who's the Associate Director of Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program, Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Mooney is the Associate Director of the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program, um, like I just said, um, <laughs> and she received her medical degree um, from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine in Chicago and her general surgical training at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. She is responsible for the direction of the NCI National Clinical Trials Network Program, the NCTN, which performs large, definitive, practice-changing phase two and three cancer treatment and advanced imaging trials. Um, and then finally, we have Lola Fashoyin Ajay, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounced that. Um, but Lola is a medical oncologist and acting deputy director in the Division of Oncology in the Office of Oncologic Diseases at the Food and Drug Administration. Prior to joining the FDA, Lola completed her residency in internal medicine and, following, and fellowship in medical oncology at Johns Hopkins. At FDA, she is a clinical reviewer in the gastrointestinal malignancies team and as acting clinical team leader for breast malignancies, mel melanoma, and sarcoma and gastrointestinal malignancies team. So that was a mouthful, so thank you for bearing with me, but um, we will be bringing our panel in just a brief moment, so stay tuned and we will see you in another minute. Hi, good afternoon. This is Danielle Leach, um, and I am happy to present the We Are In This Together, the latest from all the big players panel. Um, just a touch bit, you know, to center us, advocacy is personal, and your experience is vital to create change. And I encourage you to share your story online um, and, and work and show your voice during this process. We appreciate you being flexible. As everybody said, this has been a new uh, effort and we are proud to be working with these agencies that are key partners in the fight against colorectal cancer. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Lisa Richardson. Um, as it was mentioned before, she's the Division Director of Cancer Prevention and Control at the CDC. And she will be presenting for the next few moments um, about their work. Dr. Richardson. Okay, Dr. Richardson is frozen, so we are going to <laughs> work through this process. And as we said, this is a this is a new effort in technology, and we appreciate your patience as we work through things. So, Dr. Kimbark will start. Um, she is the program manager, as mentioned before, for the Department of Defense Peer Review Cancer Research Program, and I have had the pleasure um, with the National Brain Tumor Society working with her closely, um, and we will have her begin to present. 
Thank you very much for this opportunity. I just wanted to um, reach out to your audience and say, I would have rather been able to meet each one of you and talk to each one of you, but um, here we are. And um, if anything, this will jumpstart our ability to do um, these types of virtual interactions a little bit better. So I wanted to talk about the peer review cancer research program and how you can become personally involved in uh, the PRCRP. If, if you weren't out there um, to go and advocate, uh, then um, the PRCRP would not exist. Uh, we are not part of the president's budget, like the NCI, but we are added to the Department of Defense's appropriation each year. And um, one of the things that we really try to emphasize is our unique partnership between the military scientists, uh, disease survivors, um, consumers, and uh, policymakers. We try to bring everyone together and um, bring them together in order to fund high impact innovative research. Our inclusion uh, of patients and survivors is really about um, bringing you to the table and asking you to help us review the applications and figure out what type of research uh, that we should be funding. Should we be funding those early age onset um, uh, cases? Should we be looking at more immunotherapy uh, for CRC? These are types of things that we bring uh, patient survivors to have an equal voice and equal voting rights at our peer review and our programmatic review. In fact, our programmatic review includes Nancy Roach, who has been instrumental on our panel in, um, to um, understand the consumer and patient viewpoint, as well as making sure that we fund the best of the best. She's always been uh, very instrumental. Our vision with the PRCRP is to uh, really to um, bring about bring about the best um, research that can be funded by the PRCRP. And what we are doing is we are actually looking at um, funding uh, to advance mission readiness of, of, of the US military members affected by, ca by cancer and to improve quality of life uh, of cancer, uh, the, uh, to include, uh, excuse me, to improve quality of life by decreasing the burden of cancer on service members, their families, and the American public. The PRCRP started in 2009 with an appropriation of $15 million. And since then, we've funded uh, over 700 awards for about $430 million. Uh, annually, our topics change. Colorectal cancer wasn't added in until uh, fiscal year 10. So it's been, uh, it's been with PRCRP since fiscal year 10. And we funded about 50, $56 million and 108 awards in colorectal cancer. For fiscal year 20 that we're now um, entering, we have $110 million. And on the one side of the slide, you will see that the types of funding opportunities that we're offering this year. And one of the things that I really want to point out is some of the really new ones that we have that you could be part of our review process. First of all, we're trying to put together a, a virtual cancer center that will um, be a network of, of new, new uh, scholars that will come together and um, really look at the commonalities of cancer and trying to find out ways that we can actually learn from one cancer to the other cancer. So uh, that virtual cancer center is really going to be like a keystone part of our, um, of our funding. Uh, mechanisms this year. But another one that I want to point out to you is the one that's really on the bottom there. It's a behavioral health science award. So if you have, if you know of any um, researchers or uh, clinicians that are interested in behavioral health science and survivorship issues, this is what we're talking about, survivorship issues. There's three kinds of survivors, uh, there's three stages of survivorship. There's the very early acute survivorship, there's extended, and then there's permanent. And every single one of those have issues, psychological stress, they have um, burden of care, and they also have long-term effects that we all know are uh, 
problematic or could uh, continue, decrease your quality of life. And this is what we want to study. How can we make things better for cancer uh, patients and survivors? And all of this has to have relevance to military health. And one of the things people often add, often um, ask me is how is um, how can any of this be relevant specifically to the military? Anytime we have um, a cancer diagnosis in the military, whether it's the actual service member or um, the family, we have to really take care of mission readiness. If someone, his family member is, um, has been affected by cancer, that means that they most probably are not going to be mission ready and that unit then is not mission ready. So this is something that we take into consideration about our force readiness and um, how can we make things better for our service members, the families, veterans, and the American public overall. Because as, as uh, the Department of Defense, we have to consider mission readiness and how to protect our country um, overall I, and when we, can, when we consider um, cancer. So um, I think I'm not exactly sure how much more time I have because I forgot to set my timer. I think we can, notes, we can move on not. and um, <laughs> we can come back with questions and I'm sure we're going to have some lively discussion with everybody's questions um, after everybody presents. Um, Dr. Richardson, welcome back um, from the CDC. Um, you can begin to start to present, please. Okay, they're going to put my, my graphic up here in a second. It's the best um, perspective. And so for me, working in um, colorectal cancer, um, as well as working in cancer in general, what I do um, is all about perspective. Mental health means I'm interested in the individual, but as a health professional, I'll be in the uh, population health. So it's really the zooming in and zooming out that goes on in my head all day long when I'm thinking about work that we do. So I want to thank everyone um, on the that's fight colorectal cancer for having this event. I truly miss being there in person. It is one of the more energizing meetings that I do uh, here. Um, but I just wanted to talk about um, cancer, specific colorectal cancer and what we do at CDC. And so thanks to many of you out there on the call today, colon cancer cases and deaths have declined by about 30% among U.S. adults age 50 and older uh, over the last 15 years. So what that means is that 5,000 fewer people died in 2016, 12,000 fewer people got cancer in 2016 compared to 2006. So we are tremendous progress in this condition. Success due to screening, quite a large part actually. So we've seen the fear and embarrassment often associated with colorectal cancer slowly going, um, giving way to understanding of screening as a part of maintaining good health. Uh, with the CDC trying to become a little message on wellness. And so, Dr. If, if you, um, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt sorry. you but you're chopping in and out. So we're going to take you off again and then um, have you come oh. back. I'm sorry, but we're going to try to make sure because they can't hear you um, in from the field. Oh, okay. So, uh, we appreciate your patience as we try to make that work. Um, so we will move on okay. and the team will get in touch with you. Um, Dr. Mooney uh, okay. is the Associate Director from CTEP, uh, the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis at the National Cancer Institute. If you could begin to present, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And as you can see, um, our slide is up there for the National Cancer Institute. Certainly like to, to add my thanks along with um, Lisa's as well and everybody else on the panel to fight uh, colorectal cancer, and especially Aubrey Thielen and Molly McDonald and their entire team. Um, for including the National Cancer Institute in your discussion today and giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about NCI's role in advancing colorectal research. Um, I'd also like to thank, obviously, all the advocates um, in the field and uh, around the country and those uh, uh, tuning in virtually today um, who really work to emphasize the importance 
have sustained research to support patients and families and who have been very willing to share their stories with the public. So I'm going to talk about a couple different aspects but the, uh, of what we do at the NCI. Um, but the first is to just talk about NCI and its role in basic um, biomedical research. Um, as you know, the National, or as many of you may know, the, the National Institutes of Health is really the federal government's biomedical research agency. And the NCI is one of 27 institutes and centers that comprise NIH. NCI and NIH really are the primary supporters of basic biomedical research. And obviously for those of us at the NCI, that means we support um, science focused on sort of uncovering uh, and understanding fundamental knowledge about cancer and, and how it progresses. It's really that fundamental understanding of cancer biology that has also helped us the, and made it possible for us to begin to explore new early detection technology, new treatments, and also to um, improve cancer prevention and control. So just one example of a recent example of that, um, as many of you know, um, there have been new immunotherapy agents, um, usually called checkpoint inhibitors or PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors, that have been found to treat a variety of different um, subtypes of, of cancer, um, including subtypes of colorectal cancer. And those actually would not have been made available um, and wouldn't have been possible without basic science investments that were made um, by the American public and um, through the NCI and the NIH um, many years ago to really better understand the human immune system um, and cancer biology. So it's really basic science, which is the engine of cancer research pro uh, progress. Um, and it's important to note that the federal government and all the agencies um, represented today on the panel is really in a unique position um, to really lead in this area of research. And that's really because um, uh, it really takes decades of investment in basic science to yield these clinical discoveries. Um, while other organizations and institutions certainly do support basic research, and that's important, many of them sometimes have financial obligations that don't really enable them to make such a long-term sustained commitment um, to basic science investment. And that's where, um, through the NIH and the NCI and the federal government, we're able to help in that area. So I did want to emphasize, in addition to basic science research, um, that we also support a robust portfolio of both translate, translational and clinical research. Um, I serve, for example, or well, let me first go to the slides. So you can see that really the scope of our work at the National uh, Cancer Institute um, beyond basic science really includes um, pretty much everything in the spectrum of uh, treating and caring for people who have cancer. So that does include obviously prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, control, and survivorship. So that is the focus of the research um, at the NCI. It's along that entire spectrum. So I'll talk a little bit about my role. I'm the Associate Director of the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program at NCI. And our staff um, and the investigators that we work with, um, both in the community and at academic centers across the United States, are really um, uh, working together to conduct extensive clinical trial program that's aimed at evaluating new anti-cancer um, agents and therapies and the entire treatment modality approach um, for cancer. And this does include, as, as Lisa had pointed, or as, um, I'm sorry, Aubrey had, and Molly had pointed out earlier, that we fund both an experimental therapeutic clinical trials network that's really focused on very early development of drugs, but also a national program called the National Clinical Trials Network, which conducts across the country um, in both communities and academic centers, late phase clinical trials where we're really trying to determine um, whether a new treatment is better than what we have available already for patients. And we have multiple um, trials um, evaluating new, these new types of therapies um, in colorectal cancer, both in the past as well as currently. Many of the advances that have been made in colorectal 
colorectal cancer therapy have really come from uh, cancer trials that were supported and conducted through the intensive um, and extensive network that the NCI supports. Um, later today, you're going to hear about from some of my colleagues at NCI about activities, um, particularly focused on early um, age onset colorectal cancer, but I just wanted to share some other examples of work across the NCI. One is from our Division of um, Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, and they've developed a colon cancer risk assessment tool for both colon and rectal cancers, and that's really designed to help healthcare providers um, est and their patients um, estimate the risk of colorectal cancer over the next five years and over their lifetime for both men and women um, between ages of 45 and 85. In our Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, um, we've had some initiatives recently that have allowed us to focus on colorectal cancer, including a project that's been aimed at addressing disparities in screening and follow-up among underserved populations and high-risk subgroups um, in the United States. And lastly, another uh, example comes from our uh, Division of Cancer Prevention, which is about to launch a trial to better evaluate um, surveillance of colonoscopy approaches um, to uh, screening for colorectal cancer. Well, the last topic I just wanted to briefly touch on is that a lot of times we're asked about how we administer research at the NCI. As a federal agency, obviously, we do receive annual appropriations from Congress to support cancer research. Our budget at the NCI for fiscal year 2020 was about $6.4 billion, and about three-fourths or 75 percent of that annual appropriations is focused towards what we call extramural programs. Those are uh, programs that are conducted, as I said, in the community and at academic centers across the nation, um, the majority of which is distributed through grants um, to those investigators and institutions um, following a rigorous review process of their research proposals here at NCI. Um, so in short, we're very focused, obviously, on trying to prioritize and, and fund the most meritorious um, science. Um, this and other work supported, though, by the NCI really would not be possible without a strong community of advocates who really dedicate their time and energies to sharing their stories and helping us um, support basic cancer research, as well as the clinical trials that we conduct in other areas. Um, and all the issues uh, related to survivorship. Uh, I'd be happy a little later to talk about how we involve advocates directly in what I do in terms of clinical trials um, in my program, but also a little bit across the NCI. Um, and I wanted to also thank my colleagues at the Office of Advocacy Relations um, who help us every day work with you all um, on behalf of patients with colon cancer. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mooney. Uh, Dr. F uh, Fashoin Ajay, um, thank you. Um, Acting De Deputy Director for the Division of Oncology, the Office of Oncologic Diseases at the FDA. Um, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Wonderful. If you could please start. Sure. Um, first, uh, I would like to thank Audrey, Aubrey and all the staff at Fight Colorectal uh, for including the FDA and the Oncology Center of Excellence in this event. I'm really uh, honored to participate, and like others have said, I was really looking forward to meeting all of you uh, who are participating today virtually uh, in person, uh, but glad that technology allows us to be able to participate in this way. Um, so uh, I thought I'd start off, you know, I, I'm a medical oncologist. I, I treat patients primarily with GI malignant at the VA, um, uh, you know, uh, part of uh, uh, the week. Um, but uh, the major uh, part of uh, what I do every day is I work at FDA. Uh, I am currently an acting deputy director for one of three um, uh, divisions in our Office of Oncologic Diseases that um, has oversight over the review of uh, drugs uh, that are used for the treatment of cancer. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the times uh, people are not sure exactly what FDA does. It's sort of like a, a black box uh, where 
you may see something about FDA and commercials on TV, but what we do isn't really clear. So I thought I'd start off by sort of providing a general overview of what we do and who we are. Um, so, you know, the FDA um, really regulates a large proportion of the economy. Um, we regulate foods, cosmetics. Uh, drugs, vaccines, devices, and diagnostic tests, and even tobacco. And um, the regulation of medicine, which is what I'm going to be focusing on, uh, and of cancer in particular, occurs really in three centers at FDA. The Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, or CBER, uh, the Center for Drugs um, and Evaluation and Research, or CDER, um, and the Center for um, um, devices and uh, radiologic health, or CDRH. Um, and so when I talk about regulating, what I primarily mean is that we oversee clinical research uh, that is being conducted for uh, new investigational drugs, meaning uh, drugs uh, that have not, uh, that are not on the market uh, or available to be prescribed by doctors. And uh, so this really spans the gamut from uh, early clinical studies where um, based upon studies that have been conducted in animals, the drug, the investigational drug, is being now introduced in humans for the first time. And so the purpose of those studies is really to identify a safe dose to administer in humans, um, all the way to sort of late clinical development where uh, the trial is really designed to support an approval of a drug or and marketing of that drug. Um, so that's primarily our work is to ensure that these studies are being conducted according to all of the sort of ethical and safety um, standards uh, that have been established um, to ensure that patients aren't exposed to uh, unreasonable risk, uh, but also to ensure that those trials are actually designed in such a way as to meet their um, stated objectives. So that is what um, uh, we primarily do. Um, we, um, I mentioned the Oncology Center of Excellence. Um, this uh, sort of is a, uh, this uh, center was established in 2017. Uh, it was authorized by the 21st Century Cures Act to really uh, facilitate uh, the development and the clinical review of oncology uh, products by really uniting the scientific experts across all of FDA's um, uh, product centers, the three that I mentioned. Um, to expedite uh, the review and approval of drugs, biologics, and devices. Um, and so this center really um, kind of leverages the combined skills of all of the regulatory scientists and reviewers with expertise um, in, in the various, um, uh, in, in biologics and drugs and devices and diagnostics, um, and uh, to ensure that we're providing consistent um, uh, feedback to sponsors who are conducting these trials, um, but also so that we're sort of consistently including um, patients who are really at the center of all of what we do, including their voices and their expertise um, into our regulatory uh, work. Um, so th that's sort of an introduction to FDA and to what we do. We do not conduct trials ourselves. I think there's always a misconception that we design clinical trials. We do not design clinical trials. We do not conduct clinical trials. Um, those are conducted really by uh, academic institutions, the National Cancer Institute, other federal agencies, as you heard uh, earlier today, and um, uh, industry or pharmaceutical companies are um, actually the biggest proportion of um, uh, sponsors of the trials that we provide oversight over um, uh, here at FDA. There are many different types of trials, and we do not regulate all of them. So if a trial is being conducted on drugs that have already been approved, we typically don't um, uh, see those and we don't regulate those. Those would be conducted by cooperative groups um, and would be exempted from um, uh, review by FDA. Um, so that's a, a general introduction uh, as to what we do um, and what I do every day. Um, and I'm happy to talk more um, as the conversation goes on. Hi, um, thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Richardson, are you available yet or no? Okay. 
So what we're going to do, um, we'll skip around a little bit. And uh, Dr. Kimbark, you mentioned this and Dr. Mooney as well. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about how you can engage the patient community in your work or how do you currently do that? And how can advocates here today um, contribute to the work that you are already doing? Okay, Dr. so Kimbark, um, yes, for, um, for uh, the peer review cancer research program, one of the things that we do is um, we engage uh, consumers or patients and advocates in the peer review and programmatic review process. We ask um, you to come to our website and you can find that website just by putting in the uh, letters CDMRP into your favorite uh, search engine and uh, click on uh, CDMRP and you will find uh, consumer involvement uh, as one of the tabs on the, uh, on the tool, uh, on the upper toolbar. And what you'll see is you can be uh, uh, recruited to be part of our peer review where you will sit on a panel with uh, other consumers as well as uh, scientists and researchers and um, clinicians and you'll review application packages for impact and anything else that you are feeling comfortable reviewing. And at the end, you give complete, um, you can uh, score the complete package as well as the impact. And uh, so you will voice your opinion. You'll give strengths and weaknesses of what you think the impact is for that research. And I've literally seen uh, research be stopped in its tracks because of what consumers have said. So that's one of the things we can do as well as a programmatic review. Programmatic review is where we make our funding recommendations and we ask for consumers to be part of that as well. And so we do recruit for that as well. We appreciate that. Um, and we're going to skip around a little bit. Dr. Richardson, hopefully third time is the charm. Um, if you could uh, present uh, your work at CDC and its, you know, critical role in the fight against colorectal cancer. Okay. Since I started with a big view, small view, I love technology, but technology does not love me. So let's try again. <laughs> and I'm just going to go as quickly as possible. Most of you guys know the work that we do at CDC. Our mission there is cancer prevention and control. We are really trying to push the colorectal cancer messages around colorectal cancer screening is prevention. Um, and I think one of the examples I was going to use, and I'll still use it, is Beth, when he went to get his colon on at 50, which is really what I encourage people to do. Many of you have heard the terminology on time. That's really what we mean when we say on that people start their screening at 50. We know that. Um, as we recommend for colon cancer, and that is a huge issue. And as I was saying before I um, was asked, you know, was asked, wasn't coming through clearly, you know, that equals about 12,000, the, the improvements, 1,000 curable guys are in 2018 to 2006. And that is a really huge number and about 5,000 fewer deaths if you look at year to year. And most, quite a bit of that, I won't say most because treatments are improving so tremendously. I'm an oncologist as well, metabolologist. When I started training, stage four cancer had about a less than six month survival. And now three, four, five years, the sky is the limit almost. And quite a few of you on the phone are stage four cancer. Uh, you do have stage four cancer and you know that things have really, really, really improved. But for Will Smith, when he got his colonoscopy at 50, he had a polyp that was removed, it was a precancerous polyp, and that will never become cancer. And so those are the types of things that we're really shooting for at CDC. Our largest program at CDC for colorectal cancer is cancer control. And then we've shown that if you do what is recommended in health systems and clinics, improve screening in clinics tremendously. For the subgroup that we've had in the program for three to four years, fifth year, and we're going to refund this year, those have been in our program longest. This is all of the community guide and 
um, to screening in clinics have improved their screening by 20% in those clinics. And over half of those clinics um, serve high-risk populations because they are um, federally qualified health centers. And so I think we've made a ton of progress um, in the last 10, 20 years. Um, as other speakers have said, you know, there's a lot more to be done. I say be silly as about how do we make, make um, getting screened for colorectal cancer the default choice? How do we make it the thing that's done and not the thing that's, um, oh, I forgot to ask the person. That's part of your health and wellness checkups. And so as we continue to move on in this work, using, you know, working with people like yourselves, advocates out there, we know that to the 80% in every community that we've been shooting for part of, of the National for Colorectal Cancer Screening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. We really appreciate it. And um, you'll hear more um, during the legislative update uh, and about the asks about the critical role of the CDC. Um, to go back to our original, to the first question that we had gone uh, to during the technical difficulties, um, Dr. Mooney, can you talk about the, how do you engage the patient community at the NCI? Sure. So we have a very robust um, Office of Advocacy Relations. And so across the NCI, which is obviously a very big place, with a lot of different programs, um, they help to identify um, opportunities for advocates um, to get involved in the various activities and research of the NCI. I'll talk just a little bit about how we uh, involve patient advocates and patient representatives in the both the development, the review, and the conduct of our clinical trials programs. So for our national network, we, uh, which really encompasses both adult and pediatric cancers, um, we have um, five groups that um, conduct those national uh, trials. Each of those groups um, has a active um, patient advocacy and uh, patient representative relations um, uh, sort of committee that actually um, works with many of the advocacy groups across all the diseases that we, uh, all the different types of cancers that we do, we conduct clinical trials in. And those advocates sitting on those committees actually help in um, developing um, new uh, proposals for clinical trials, um, as well as important translational science as well. And in many cases, many of the advocates um, and patient representatives also um, have scientific backgrounds and can help in that. But in general, when they when any of the groups proposes a scientific proposal, they've had had the input, input excuse me, of patient advocates as to the importance, the feasibility, um, and the structure of that clinical trial. Now, when those proposals come in in our national network to NCI, we have actually NCI disease-specific steering committees. Those are national. They include representatives from um, our extramural, extramural excuse me, uh, community, um, as well as NCI, but they also include patient advocates and patient representatives. And they review all those trial proposals for those national trials with us. They have an equal vote on determining whether those uh, uh, particular proposals should go forward. And I'd also like to emphasize, I think what Donna said as well, that many times we found that the patient advocates and patient representatives have been critical in terms of identifying feasibility issues, importance issues, um, and issues related to both quality of life and toxicity um, in determining whether those trials should be funded um, and go forward um, within our large clinical trials network. The last area is really in um, helping monitor the, and oversee the conduct of the trials. For all our um, large fa randomized phase two trials and all our phase three trials, we ha um, have what we call data safety and monitoring boards. Those are, that's an independent um, operating board that reviews the safety of the trial um, in terms of its um, main endpoint, what it's looking at in terms of improving, whether it's overall survival or disease progression. And they monitor the trial um, confidentially um, throughout its course. And we, on all those data safety and monitoring boards, 
um, include patient advocates and or patient representatives. And last but not least, we have an NCI um, Central uh, Institutional Review Board, or IRB, and we are always looking for um, people who are interested in participating on that board. Those boards, again, oversee all the clinical trials that the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program does. They also, those um, IRBs, also oversee many of the trials done by our Division of Cancer Prevention. So Thank I hope you. That helps. I appreciate that. And as a person who has uh, sat on those NCI committees, I can attest to the critical role the patient voice has and how well respected it is in the process. Um, Dr. Fashayin Ajay, um, can you talk a little bit about the FDA and the role of patient advocates and patient engagement? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, at FDA, we um, really recognize the um, importance and have uh, developed a ways to um, really systematically ensure that patients' experiences and their perspectives and patients' needs and priorities are really captured and, um, and meaningfully uh, incorporated in a, sort of our regulatory framework in drug development and our evaluation of uh, investigational drugs. And so we, we like to think that all of what we do is for the patient, and so the patient's really at the center of all of what um, we do in terms of uh, reviewing drugs and making determinations regarding um, whether they provide benefit and whether they're safe and whether they're tolerable. So the, 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 the primary goal really of um, a patient-focused drug development, which is really an, a program, an initiative at FDA, is to really uh, better incorporate the patient's voice in drug development and evaluation. And this includes really... Um, you know, facilitating uh, ways to collect and utilize um, data that comes from the patient and their caregivers and not just rely upon the data uh, uh, regarding the safety of a drug that is recorded uh, by a prescriber. Um, encouraging really uh, and identifying approaches and best practices to um, facilitate patient enrollment in, in trials. Uh, and minimize the burden of uh, participating in clinical trials for patients, um, but also incorporating patient voice in our decision making. And so one uh, important way that patients participate in our decisions regarding approval of drugs is by participating in our advisory committees, which are really meetings that um, we uh, conduct uh, and invite uh, experts from academia, from uh, we invite patients, um, to really provide their perspective on important regulatory clinical questions that we have uh, regarding uh, applications uh, that are under review by us. So that's an important way that we incorporate a patient voice. Another important way is um, uh, through, um, again, this uh, patient-focused development program, which uh, we uh, uh, patient advocacy groups can submit uh, requests to uh, to participate in listening sessions where um, you know a group of patients can come to the FDA um, and uh, have all of the important uh, clinical policy uh, staff at FDA uh, come to those meetings and listen to really the patient's experience uh, in a particular disease setting uh, and and the priorities are really set by the advocacy group and and these kinds of meetings are really important because it it really helps you know, many of us uh, are still taking care of patients, so we, we do hear, you know, what are some of the barriers that patients face. Um, but I think it's good for other um, staff who may not be clinical staff uh, to really have that um, interaction with patients and really hear what some of the challenges are and what are some of their requests are uh, and to incorporate that in our, de our decision-making. So that's one way. And, of course, you know, the Oncology Center of Excellence um, has, a, you know, a, a large part of what we do is external engagement with, with many stakeholders, including, you know, the American Society of Clinical Oncology or ASCO or AACR, um, and um, on many different sort of clinical and policy issues. And we always, always incorporate our patients' uh, voice. And I know Danielle has participated in many of these efforts uh, in the past. Um, so those are just some of the ways that um, patient uh, voice is incorporated uh, in the work that we do. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. Richardson, I mean, I know we've sat down and had meetings and uh, sitting down and uh, talking about the with the patient community. Can you talk a little bit about how CDC engages with the patient advocate community? Yeah, so one of the ways we engage is what we're doing right now, uh, working with people, groups like yours, the Fight Colorectal Cancer Group and, and others to get the message out about um, screening, um, what tests are, um, and to help give those messages to out to the public um, to help them understand um, what's going on with that. And so I would say, similar to what the other speakers have said, we're always trying to bring in the patient voice to inform the work so that um, we don't go off and do something that isn't needed, doesn't resonate, and um, isn't true um, to the patient experience. And truth is really about what, you know, what we feel about what's going on, not necessarily what the abstract facts are. And so that really is where, you know, in the work I do, leading our group is to really get that voice into the work that we do um, moving forward and developing the things that help people get screened. Terrific. Thank you so much. There is another question. This one's particular to Dr. Kim Bark from the, um, from the community online. The CDMRP doesn't seem to have a program for colorectal cancer. So does peer review cancer research program include colorectal cancer? Currently? Yes, it does. Uh, we've included colorectal cancer. Actually, Congress has included uh, colorectal cancer in the, P in the PRCRP for the last 10 years. And um, it's been very successful. We've funded over $56 million um, into just colorectal cancer. And um, last year, we funded our first clinical trial in colorectal cancer. And I think this year, we're funding another two or three clinical trials for colorectal cancer. So yes, um, you, you look towards the peer review cancer research program to cover colorectal cancer. Terrific. Um, let's talk about you know, what's coming up in the year ahead. Is there a project or an initiative that you are most excited about for the colorectal cancer community and your existing work? Uh, Dr. Mooney, is there something that you would like to share? Well, I think um, uh, we fund, um, obviously, clinical trials in colorectal cancer. Um, you know, across our program every year. So, um, but one thing that uh, trial that, uh, there are two trials that in particular are about to be launched or will be launched later in the year. One is our division of cancer from our division of cancer prevention. That's really going to look at five versus 10 years in terms of colonoscopy screening for um, particular uh, patients who have particular types of uh, polyps to try to make sure that when we do screen, um, we screen the patients um, at, at average risk, but we also make sure that we understand how much we have to screen those patients as opposed to patients who are on higher risk groups. Um, another one is in um, patients who have what we call stage two colon cancer. Um, where we're trying to use a new uh, uh, biomarker in the blood to determine whether those patients for whom we're not always sure whether chemotherapy will benefit them or not, and whether that blood test um, that we uh, monitor the patients by throughout um, the course of, uh, of uh, after they've had a complete resection of their colon cancer, whether that will help us identify patients um, in that uh, stage of colon cancer who ha are at particular risk. So those are two examples, um, and I hope that's a little helpful. Terrific. Um, Dr. Kimbark, is there anything you'd like to add on that, on that note? Yes, we have, um, I, I just mentioned it just shortly ago, and that was the idea of the Behavioral Health Science Award. I'm very excited about this because we're really trying to zero in on survivorship issues and um, what it means to be a survivor of cancer, especially um, colorectal cancer for this group. We are actually involving patient advocates in the actual application itself, as well as the review. I'm looking forward to seeing how this can um, actually change how we look at cancer and how we look at survivorship overall. I think that that's one of the things we don't pay much attention to is the psychological effects of having a cancer diagnosis as well as um, the long-term effects. 
Well, thank you very much. We are, have run out of time um, and we appreciate the panel's uh, patience and uh, their, uh, their um, contribution to the training today. And I'd like to turn it over to Molly McDaniel um, to uh, the next steps. Great, thanks Danielle, and thank you so much to all of our panelists who participated. Um, you know, it, it obviously isn't easy when we're using technology to feed everyone in from all of these different places. So, you know, we appreciate all of our panelists for being willing to do it, um, and also to all of you for your grace and your patience as we make this work. So, again, Danielle, thank you so much for being here with us in person and, and rolling with the punches. Um, and so now we are going to take a brief break, about 10 minutes. So go grab lunch, go, you know, grab a snack, do whatever you need to do. And we will be back shortly um, with our legislative deep dive panel. Welcome back to virtual call on Congress. I hope you all enjoyed the first panel and hearing from our leaders at the CDC, the DOD, NCI and FDA. Hearing about all the great work they are doing is exactly why advocacy is important. Congress needs to hear from us about why these programs are important and what they mean to colorectal cancer patients, their loved ones, and even those who haven't even been impacted yet. So let's jump into our legislative deep dive with Molly McDonald, our Director of Advocacy. Hi everyone, thanks for sticking with us um, throughout all of this. And um, so like Aubrey said, we are going to jump in to our legislative deep dive and talk about the programs um, that we just heard so much about from um, you know the folks who are the boots on the ground um, so if we could go ahead and go to my next slide um, and the next one after that <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, our agenda for today and what we're going to cover um, so during the session, um, I want to start with providing just some background about how Congress actually makes funding decisions and what that looks like. Um, then I'll dig into a little bit more of what we're asking for and why, um, what our virtual Hill Day is going to look like, um, and what you can do to get involved. And then at the end, I just want to talk a little bit about what else Fight CRC is working on and, and some of the exciting things that we've got coming up. So if we could go ahead and go to my next slide. Um, so let's talk about appropriations. It's one of those words that um, you know is thrown around a lot in DC. It can sound a little intimidating and maybe confusing, but it's really pretty simple. So appropriations is just the process by which Congress makes decisions for how various government agencies and programs should be funded. Um, it's a process that they go through every year. So it typically starts in February or March. Um, and in a perfect world, it's completed over the summer in advance of the start of the fiscal year, which starts October 1st. Whether or not that always happens is another thing, but we don't have to go there now. Um, so if you'll go ahead and go to my next slide, um, this is a little a basic overview of what that process looks like um, and, and kind of how it works. So it starts with members, member requests. Basically, every member of Congress um, in both the House and the Senate has an opportunity to go on the record about programs that are priorities for them. So this usually takes the form of a letter that they'll send um, that outlines, you know, what the program is, what it does, why it's important, and what funding level they think the program should receive. So members can send multiple letters, um, and, and of course, the more that members weigh in about a particular program, the more attention it's likely to get. The next step in the process is the Appropriations Committee. So there's an Appropriations Committee in both the House and the Senate, and it's made up essentially of a few dozen members whose job it is to actually write the 12 appropriations bills. Um, and so those 12 bills cover various government agencies. So for example, there's one bill that covers agricultural programs. There's one that covers energy programs, uh, healthcare programs, and so on. So it's the Appropriations Committee to actually write the bills um, and kind of do all the back and forth reviewing the members, um, the members' letters and, and what, their, um, what their priorities are. The next step is a House and Senate vote. So once the committees on both sides of the Capitol work through their process, um, the full House and Senate, Senate must vote on those bills. 
Um, so that, again, allows all 435 members of the House and all 100 members of the Senate to approve or disapprove of those bills. And so once that process is complete, we go to what's called a conference committee. So because the House and the Senate both go through their own process, often their bills don't match up. And so basically they all have to get together in a room and hash out the differences between those bills. And so once that process is complete and you know they've all um, duked it out over the different programs and they've come to an agreement, then that agreement has to pass the House and Senate again. So then it could go to the president for signature and become law. So I wanted to lay that out just to make the point that one, this is a very long process and one where there's multiple points when we can weigh in. But right now we're at a really important point because we're right in between the um, member request and appropriations committee process. So we're just at the tail end of the deadline for when members can submit their requests to the appropriations committee. So this is a key time for us to weigh in to make sure that our voice is heard about our um, funding priorities. So if we could go to the next slide. So what are we asking for? Um, you've obviously gotten a preview of this um, with our, our first panel, but I just want to go over quickly um, sort of the broad asks and then um, some key um, sort of decisions that we made around, you know, why we asked for those numbers. So we are asking for $70 million for the CDC's colorectal cancer control program, um, $120 million for the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program, and $44.68 billion for the National Institutes of Health, and $6.92 billion for the National Cancer Institute. Those are big numbers um, and, you know, can be sort of difficult to wrap your head around. Um, but so, you know, we, we did have a process into why we picked those numbers. And so for the colorectal cancer control program, currently that program doesn't cover the entire country. So there are grantees that are throughout the country, but it's not scaled to reach all the communities that are in need. And so we worked with our advocacy partners and the CDC to come up with a number that we felt would allow the CDC to be able to spread um, that program nationally. And so, um, so 70 million was, was where we landed on that. So it's really important um, you know, for us to be able to back up what numbers we're asking for. Then in terms of the DOD, where we're asking for 120 million for the peer-reviewed cancer research program, that represents a $10 million increase over the funding level last year. So that is a consistent increase um, from the year be years before that will allow them to not only to continue to do the great work that they're doing, but also to hopefully expand on, on all of their good work that Dr. Kim Bark talked about. Um, and finally, the numbers around NIH. So $44.68 billion for NIH um, and $6.92 billion for NCI. So these numbers were the result of um, a discussion among the entire patient community. So um, as in years past, we've gotten together with our partners in advocacy, both in the cancer space and beyond, to talk about um, you know, what we need out of the NIH and, um, and their various institutes and, and how we can come together to advocate for that. So it's worked really well in the past because we've been able to um, see significant increases year over year and we can leverage the combined power of multiple different advocacy groups when we're all singing from the same song sheet. So these numbers, a $3 billion increase for NIH and a $500 million increase for NCI are bold yet reasonable increases that, again, will allow the NIH to continue to do the good work that they're doing um, and also expand into other projects. So if we go to my next slide, please. So let's dig into each ask a little bit. So um, obviously um, you've heard about the colorectal cancer control program from Dr. Lisa Richardson herself um, and all of the good work that it does. But let's just go over it again to make sure that everyone is comfortable. So um, the CRCCP seeks to increase screening among people ages 50 to 75, particularly in underserved communities. And so they work with state health departments, universities, tribal organizations 
to implement evidence-based programs that have been proven to um, that have been proven effective to increase colorectal cancer screening. So some of the things that they do are implementing a system to remind both medical professionals and patients that it's time for screening, making it easier for patients to get screened by providing transportation, childcare, um, extending clinic hours, simplifying paperwork, offering patient navigators, um, and also offering different screening modalities. So um, it just it's helping implement programs that can make people um, have easier access to colorectal cancer screening. And one really important part about this program is that it uses data to show its, the, its effectiveness. And that's another really important piece for us to think about as we go to Capitol Hill is that the CDC has done a great job of looking at what the program has done so far and looking how it's been successful so we can go to the Hill and say, this has been working, so let's increase funding so it can get into more communities. Um, and so in terms of what you can see on the slide here, and maybe we can, you know, make it big so everyone can see it, but, um, you know, there's a lot of information that you've received today already um, from Dr. Richardson and the rest of us folks. Um, but in terms of, you know, key takeaways, why is funding important? Why do we need to be advocating for these? These are some of the main points that I think are really important. So. First being that um, the colorectal cancer control program has supported a number of different organizations um, towards this, towards increasing colorectal cancer screening, and they've served um, a, a million patients in the United States so far, which is incredible. Um, and, and they've also been able to increase screening rates um, by 10.3% over the first three years of the program, um, which is a great accomplishment and something that given additional funding, they'll only be able to continue to build on. And so, you know, I think a, a good way to really sort of sum up this program is that it's about prevention and colorectal cancer is um, rare in the sense that um, it is preventable if caught early. And so we need to make sure that we're taking the steps that we can um, to, to address this preventable disease. Um, so if we can move on to my next slide. Um, so our next ask is the $120 million for the peer-reviewed cancer research program. Um, again, PRCRP, another mouthful, um, funds innovative, high-impact medical research for cancer prevention, detection, treatment, um, and survivorship for 15 different cancers, including colorectal cancer. Um, so I know we had a question about this in the last panel that um, Dr. Kim Bark addressed, but if you go to the CDMRP, Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program website, you may not see colorectal cancer right away because it's tucked within the peer-reviewed cancer research program um, and, and doesn't have its own separate line. So that's an important thing to know. And so PRCRP really focuses on areas of need and works to advance research that's underdeveloped in cancer. Um, and another important piece of this is that it's really complementary to the work that NIH and NCI are doing. Um, it's not duplicative. The two agencies work closely together and, um, you know, where NIH may not be able to, um, you know, dig into the research as much, that's where DOD can come in. And so again, you know, we need to make sure that, um, you, that this program has consistent and robust funding so that researchers can continue to do the work they're doing and also expand into other areas. And another important thing to note is that colorectal cancer being on the list of eligible diseases um, is not guaranteed. And so that's another really important part of why we need to um, advocate on the Hill for its inclusion. And, and that was something that um, Dr. Kimbark talked about as well, is that, you know, I, I, I think her words were, you know, if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for advocates, we wouldn't be able to continue this program. And I think coming from someone who um, is so intimately involved in the program, that's a really strong statement of the importance of advocacy and, um, and why we need to, to raise our voices and make sure that our members of Congress understand that this is important. Um, so we can go to my next slide. Um, okay, so NIH and NCI, $44.68 billion for National Institutes of Health and $6.92 billion for the National Cancer Institute. So again, um, as Dr. Mooney talked about, the NIH is sort of, 
the umbrella. And so within the NIH, they have 27 different institutes, including the National Cancer Institute. And so the NIH really focuses on foundational research um, that forms the building blocks of life-saving treatments and cures. And NCI is that principal agency that's focusing on um, cancer research on everything from basic research to clinical trials. Um, and so if we could just zoom in on this slide quickly, um, again, it's really important that we make sure that this research is continued. And as um, Dr. Mooney talked about, it takes decades of research to um, see some of these breakthroughs. And so if there's a year when all of a sudden there's a drop off in funding or NIH or NCI is not getting the funding that it needs, it can interrupt and slow that progress. And so again, I know that we talk about these programs year after year, but I can't overemphasize, it's not because we're not being creative, it's because each year we have to continue to fight for them. Um, and another um, just piece of this that I wanted to draw some attention to is if you look at this chart on the bottom, that's the funding level for colorectal cancer research at NCI. And as you can see over the past couple of years, it's been decreasing. And so that's another important reason why we need to make sure that we're keeping colorectal cancer on people's radars. There's a lot of other cancers out there that are vying for attention. And, and of course, they're all, you know, merit as much funding as they need. But um, we need to make sure that, you know, we're continuing to talk about it and um, continuing to make sure that, that it's on the radars of our legislators and decision makers. So next slide, please. Um, so, to that end, um, obviously in the past, call on Congress has culminated in an in-person day when we are going to Capitol Hill, meeting with our members of Congress and their staff, um, sharing our story in person, um, and talking about the, the um, legislative and funding programs that we care about. Based on the current circumstances, we can't do that, but it doesn't mean that we can't still have an impact. So we have decided to transition to a virtual Hill Day and set a bold goal of sending 5,000 emails to Congress in support of research funding for colorectal cancer prevention um, and research. And so um, we'll talk a little bit in a second about how we're going to do that. But I do want to mention one thing um, that we've seen come up in the comments a little bit. Um, we obviously can't ignore what's going on in the world today. Um, Coronavirus is obviously the top of mind for um, most Americans and, and certainly um, members of Congress. There's a lot they're working on. There's a lot that they need to do. Um, but at the same time, the work on the funding process continues. So, um, you know, this is part of the reason why we're sending emails. We're not flooding their office with calls, um, but so that we're being mindful and respectful of the fact that they have other issues that they need to deal with, very pressing and serious issues. Um, but also we're making sure that our voice is heard and, and registered because the appropriations process has not been put on hold. Um, it, is, it is continuing. So we're certainly mindful of everything else that's going on. And um, I think that we can still make a, a strong and respectful mark um, by sending these emails um, with the things that we care about. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll dig into a little bit more about what Virtual Hill Day will look like. Um, so tomorrow morning, you should look out for an email in your inbox that's going to have all the instructions you need on how to take action. So we've made it really easy. We've already drafted the email. It includes all the numbers, all the acronyms, all the program names. Um, there is a spot at the bottom where you can add your story. You can add a personal message um, if you're comfortable, but if not, you click go and we'll make sure that it gets to the right spot. So um, once you take action, once you click that button, um, it's really as easy as that. And you'll receive a confirmation email um, that you can either forward on to friends and family or you can use the original email to forward on um, to help everyone else get involved too. You know, 5,000 emails is a bold goal. We're going to need to expand our community uh, in order to reach that. And so um, I think Again, it's something that it's not going to be a big burden for people. It takes a minute to do. And so now's the time to um, you know, reach out to your friends and family. I've heard some people call it their tribe, those people that support you and love you, um, to just take this one quick action to help us do something truly incredible. 
Um, and so another piece of that is social media. We've all seen the power of social media, um, the things that it can do for good. And so this is a great opportunity to let people know that you've taken action, um, share your story, send, uh, post a strong arm selfie, um, post a picture of you, you know, hitting the button and, um, you know, sending that email. Um, it's just a great way to continue to raise awareness and get people talking about this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so make sure you, um, you tag um, at FightCRC and use the hashtag CONC2020 so that we can keep track of all that you're doing. And we obviously love to see your strong arm selfies and your pictures and, um, and it'll just be a great way for all of us to connect um, even though we're all in the comfort of our own homes. So next slide, please. So the next piece that I wanna talk about <clears throat> um, it's just what else we're working on at Fight CRC. So Call on Congress is an incredibly important event. It is our cornerstone advocacy event, um, but it's only a couple of days a year, and we are busy year round, um, building rela relationships, advocating for policies, developing education and edu educational materials um, to help you know, make sure that we're doing everything we can to support the colorectal cancer community. And so I wanted to just give a snapshot on, on some of those other things that we're working on. Um, so of course, many of you will be familiar with the Removing Barriers to Colorectal Cancer Screening Act. That's something that we have advocated before during call on Congress year after year. We have certainly not forgotten about it. Um, we are continuing to work on it. And for those who are less familiar, um, this is essentially to address an issue in, in Medicare. So, Medicare currently covers colonoscopies without any cost sharing or out-of-pocket costs um, as a preventative service. But if you are a Medicaid patient and you, or Medicare patient, excuse me, and you go in and receive a colonoscopy and a polyp is found and removed, it's recategorized um, as a different type of procedure and so you can wake up with an out-of-pocket cost. That's obviously a big deterrent to colorectal cancer screening um, and not the way that we believe the law was intended to work. So we have been working on this issue for many years, um, but have made incredible progress this year. We have over 300 co-sponsors in the House, over 60 in the Senate. Um, and as of today, the House has passed this um, bill twice, um, which is pretty incredible, um, and has shown really the bipartisan support for this common sense legislation. And so don't think that we've forgotten about this. You'll be hearing um, more about this in the coming months. Um, as we really um, ramp up to have um, the Senate hopefully take action and, and get this bill over the finish line. Um, another bill I wanted to talk about was the Clinical Treatment Act. So that's something that we've been working with several of our um, partner organizations on um, and would provide coverage for care costs associated with clinical trials for those on Medicaid. Um, so this is another important piece um, to help in increase access to clinical trials. Um, another piece of legislation that we've been working on um, is the Cancer Drug Parity Act. Um, and this, again, we're working with um, a number of other organizations in the cancer space to ensure that oral chemotherapy is covered no less favor favorably than the way that IV chemo is, is, is covered. So this is really important because we're seeing more and more oral chemo drugs come onto the market. Um, and we want to make sure that the decision is between you and your doctor um, and not based off of you know, what type of coverage you might have. Um, and so a couple of other things that I want to touch on that we're always doing year round um, is, uh, as I mentioned before, building partnerships. Um, so it's really important that we're able to work with um, organizations across the cancer and other disease state. Um, we, you know, are able to lock arm in arm with them to advance policies that impact all patients, not just colorectal cancer patients. And so um, it's been a great way um, for us to do that. And also for us, um, you know, if sometimes if we support legislation that um, other groups are working on, then um, they also support us. So it's been a great way for us to get additional support for um, the colorectal cancer screening bill. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with our work with NIH and NCI, um, it's a great way for us to, you know, really move these big policy initiatives. 
Um, the other piece is that we've made a really big effort to make sure that we are at the table where key decisions are being made. And so that may be in Washington, D.C. or elsewhere, but you know, we are establishing um, Fight CRC as a trusted voice and, res and resource um, both for and uh, or for the colorectal cancer community. So we sit on a number of different panels and task forces within NCI, FDA, um, DOD and others so that we're amplifying your voice and making sure that when these big decisions are made, the voice of the colorectal cancer community is there. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing at the state level. So um, many of you are familiar with the state proclamations, and we um, have developed a toolkit each year that we send out to folks so that they can request their governor to declare March as Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So we've been incredibly successful with this. It's been a great way for advocates to get to know their governors um, and help to raise awareness at the state level around colorectal cancer. Um, and so if we could go to my next slide, please. Um, so this next piece is something that we are really, really excited about. Um, Fight CRC has primarily been focused um, on advocacy at the federal level. That will absolutely continue, but um, we've you know, realized that there's a lot of action happening on the state level. We have developed an incredible network of advocates um, across all 50 states um, that we can really leverage and who are active and, and ready to get involved. And so this year we are launching the Catalyst State by State Advocacy Program. Um, and so this is really a program that is dedicated to um, accelerating policy change around colorectal access to colorectal cancer screening. Um, and so we are funding um, a number of states to um, implement primarily two different um, policy initiatives. So one is ensuring that um, folks have access to screening starting at 45 in accordance with American Cancer Society guidelines. Um, and also that there's no um, out-of-pocket cost for a follow-up colonoscopy following a first-line colorectal cancer screening test such as a FIT, FOBT, or stool DNA. So, these are two key issues that we're seeing started, start to percolate at the state level and, and two things that we know are really important to the community. And so we're really excited to be able, um, with, the help, with help from Exact Sciences, to be able to provide funding for um, coalitions at the state level to implement policy um, or legislative or regulatory change around these issues. And so. We have already selected the four grantees, um, and in the coming week, we will announce them. We're super excited. We can't wait to tell you who they are and what they're working on. Um, but ultimately, our hope is to scale this to all 50 states. Like I said, we have an incredible network, um, and we know that we can um, you know, build this out so that states can be sharing best practices and sharing their experiences, um, and ultimately, we can build a network and, and be involved in policy change um, across the United States. So we are incredibly excited about it, and you are going to hear more in the coming weeks. So again, call on Congress is, is not the only time for advocacy. There's things that we can be doing all year round. So in the coming weeks and months, um, definitely keep an eye out because we're going to be coming to you with more opportunities to be engaged. So um, that pretty much sums up um, my presentation for the day, but I know that we've got some questions, and I've got Aubrey here who's taking your questions from social media and email, um, so I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Yes, thank you very much, Molly. That, From what we've been hearing online, it's been great feedback about how clear you were in your presentation. Very happy about it. Um, Thanks, guys. <laughs> and so we got a few questions and some questions that I actually have. I know that you're a very experienced person when it comes to being on the Hill, getting engaged with legislators, and also making sure that we have great partners in the things that we do. So I just wanted to ask if you can talk a little bit about how many advocacy partners, coalitions, that kind of thing that we are on as Fight CRC and why it's important that we have those partners. I know you touched on it a little bit, but... I want to make sure that we really shout out how that works and how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. So it would take a lot of time for me to list out every single coalition that we sit on, but 
Um, one that sticks out to me is the Cancer Leadership Council. So we work closely with them and they represent a broad group of different um, cancer patient organizations. Um, and we get together each month and really talk through what are the key issues that are facing the cancer community? Where are areas that we can come together to work on policy or to put out a statement to make sure that we're flagging things um, for Hill staff or the administration or or other folks um, so that they understand um, the voice of the cancer community. So that's incredibly important. We also work closely with a group called One Voice Against Cancer, um, and they are really focused on the appropriations process and funding. So we work closely with them as we develop our funding asks to, again, make sure that um, you know we're not the only voice on the Hill asking for these things, but that we can leverage the strength of multiple patient organizations and multiple communities um, to be able to to really push things over the finish line. So um, it's it's a great way to be able to share resources and share experiences um, and also to to you know keep up with the latest um, policy issues that are facing the cancer community. Definitely, I know that those partners are essential. So I just wanted to make sure that we really touch on that. Um, we got another question to talk a little bit about forming relationships with policymakers and even staffers and how important that is for people as they go forward, as they engage over the year, the next year or following years on colorectal cancer policy. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I spent a number of years um, as a staffer on Capitol Hill before coming to call on Congress. And so I can say it really makes a huge difference when you work to build a relationship with an office and particularly with the staff. Um, the staff are the gatekeeper to that member. Um, and if you have a great relationship with them, you effectively have a great relationship with the member. And so again, as I've said before, you know, advocacy is not just one day a year. And so Obviously, we are in a you know, challenging time, challenging circumstances, um, but in a perfect world where we would be able to go up to the Hill, you know, it's, it's great to be able to meet them once a year, but then to continue to stay involved, you know, email they, them as you see news about the member or as um, you have mm -hmm. questions about various policies that are coming up. It just is a great way to, um, you know, make sure that you're staying on their radar and that they're continuing to you know, remember you and the colorectal cancer community as they are, um, you know, going about their legislative work. Definitely. Yeah, that is essential as well, just like our partners. We did get a question on where they can find all the details about the things that you spoke about. I'm so glad you asked. Um, so we, um, we really worked hard this year to um, put together really clear and hopefully helpful um, issue briefs around each of our asks. So if you're watching on our website, you should be able to go just below the live stream um, and there's just gonna be links to our issue briefs, um, a fact sheet for colorectal cancer, um, and one other thing that I'm forgetting, but it's great. Um, and so you'll be able to um, go over, it'll have all the things that I talked about earlier today about each of our asks um, around the NIH and NCI, the peer-reviewed cancer research program, um, and the CDC's colorectal cancer control program. Um, and one thing I really do want to highlight in those issue briefs is that we also included um, you know, real-world testimonies from real people who have been impacted by these programs. Um, and so I think it's a great way to, again, bring it home and that these programs um, you know, really do touch um, actual people's lives and they're more than just these big numbers and this alphabet soup of, of acronyms. And so I would really encourage you to, to take a look. And um, as always, we welcome your feedback on you know, what's helpful and what's not. But um, I think they turned out really great. And um, you know, shout out to Andrew Wartman, our community engagement manager, who is an incredible, incredible graphic designer and has made them look um, you know, really, really beautiful. And I think um, you know, really help sort of drive home um, what we're what we're asking for that was great yes definitely you can if you're not on our website you can go to calloncongress.org and you'll be redirected to this live stream and where those resources currently are housed so i think one last question that we have with the time we have left is to talk i know you touched on this just a bit but i think that advocates are worried about 
over the over the next space of time as COVID-19 and coronavirus is really affecting a lot of our daily lives, how can they get involved still with advocacy and what can they do from home as they go forward in the next couple months? Yeah, I think it's a great point. We're obviously um, a little bit in uncharted territory here, um, but I think it's going to be a really exciting way to show the power of social media and virtual engagement. Um, so we, as I said, you know, we've set this bold goal around 5,000 emails. I think it's a great way to get involved, both from the perspective of a lot of folks are at home right now, um, you know, maybe trying to navigate working from home and all of those things. Um, and also, you know, members of Congress are hunkered down themselves. And so they'll still be working, but many of their staff are also working from home. And so they're looking for ways to engage that doesn't involve an in-person meeting. Um, and even sometimes a phone call can now be difficult because a lot of staff will not be in the office to answer the phones. And so, um, you know, sending an email is a great way to, um, you know, still get engaged. And I think, you know, if we can hit our goal of 5,000 emails, it'll be such a strong and powerful statement about, you know, the resilience and, mm -hmm. and the relentlessness of the colorectal cancer community, um, while still being mindful of the fact that there's other things going on in the world that are, um, of course, challenging and, um, and difficult. Definitely. Thank you so much, Molly. I think this was really informative. I hope that everyone online that's viewing feels really well informed on our asks, our legislative priorities. And if you had some extra questions, we are out of time on this panel, but we will be sure to answer those online. Welcome back. It's time for our final panel and one that we are particularly excited about. The National Cancer Institute and Fight CRC are tackling early age onset colorectal cancer. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Matt Young, Program Officer, Division of Cancer Biology, National Cancer Institute, and Phil Dashner, Program Director, Division of Cancer Biology, National Cancer Institute. Dr. Young is a program director for, ga for gastrointestinal cancers at the Cancer Biomarkers Research Group, Division of Cancer Prevention, and Dr. Young is well recognized for his earlier studies in the Laboratory of Cancer Prevention at the NCI, where his research was focused on gene regulation of tumor production, mouse models for cancer prevention, and dietary intervention to prevent colorectal cancer. Phil J. Dashner, MSC, Program Director, Division of Cancer Biology, currently manage a, manages a portfolio of basic research grants focused on the mechanisms of biologic carcinogens for the cancer immunology, hematology, and etiology branch of the NCI. He received his graduate training from Arizona State University and has a background in microbial genetics and drug discovery from natural products, which includes the initial purification and testing of virostatin and the identification of curcumin and reversoratol as natural ligands in the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And moderating the, the discussion is Fight, CRC, Fight CRC's own Andy Dwyer. Andy, Andrea Andy Dwyer is our research and patient education advisor. She also works at the University of the Colorado Cancer Center. Andrea Andy is a, is a public health practitioner with the University of, Co of Colorado Cancer Center and Colorado School of Public Health. She joined Fight Colorectal Cancer to advise the development of research and health education programs based on her experience in cancer prevention and control research. As the director of the, Col the Colorado Cancer Screening Program, she is a leader in patient navigation and established established one of the largest screening patient navigation programs in the country. Andy currently serves as the chair for the National Navigation Roundtable and incoming chair to the, Col the Colorado Cancer Coalition. Colorectal cancer is personal to Andy. Her mother was diagnosed with an early stage disease in her 40s, which has sparked Andy's passion for early age onset research. 
leadership to convene international research collaborations, and alongside Fight CRC and the American Cancer Survivor. Society, she actively engaged in the new data review processes to update the ACS's guidelines from 50 to 45 in 2018. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Andy, followed by the rest of our panelists. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. It's great to uh, see everyone and super excited to have uh, Dr. Matt Young and Phil Dashner, who have been my partners in crime, so to speak, over the last um, year to really engage in early age onset discussions for research. And I just want to take um, a moment to say that we really um, have enjoyed so much of the work that um, the National Cancer Institute and many of the partners who joined from our federal agencies this morning, including the American Cancer Society, the Department of Defense, NIH, FDA, and many others have spent their time and energies and really looking at early age onset disease. So I'm um, really excited to have uh, the opportunity to moderate this panel. Um, and from the team um, at Fight CRC and Mission Control, will we have an opportunity to go ahead and throw my slides into the queue? Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to get started um, this afternoon by talking a little bit about the active collaboration that we've had with the National Colorectal Roundtable. And I think as Molly has noted throughout um, our discussion is really the name of the game is partnership. So the NCCRT, the American Cancer Society, um, Dr. Tom Weber and his team, many um, organizations throughout the country have been for the last five to 10 years really engaged in understanding um, what is no longer to be anecdote related to the uptake in young folks developing chlorotal cancer. And in 2017, had a great opportunity for Fight CRC to really get, engage this work. Um, with the leadership of many of the partner organizations who've been represented today, and also the research community, as well as the patient voice, ultimately, we were able in February um, of last year, just about a year ago, to convene um, one of the larger discussions around etiology and study of research aims to really think about this um, incidence uptake in a chlorotal cancer. And I think when we look back to 2015-16, when we were starting to see data that, of course, it was no longer anecdote, but that it was a really legitimate scientific and medical concern that we were seeing so many young folks um, dying and developing the disease that we really needed to do more about this work. So in partnership with so many of the folks, we really did have taken a time to develop an early age onset working group um, we can be national leaders um, as well as international leaders in our first um, discussions in February um, with over five countries, and we're gearing up for some great work in 2020, um, and hopefully that if we can this summer uh, make a travel to Europe to have some discussions with over 18 countries about furthering our engagement in the international work around colorectal cancer. So Dr. Dasher is going to talk a little bit about some of the group and the work that we've done together and some of the things that we're exploring in terms of etiology, causation, and understanding the reasons for colorectal cancer. So we're really excited um, to have Dr. Young go ahead and take us from here. But before, as we cue this up, I just want to say um, a huge thank you for everyone who's been engaged in this work. And I think that um, we have a number of families, advocates, and folks who've lost people or are going through the fight right now. And this is a very emotional um, time for Fight CRC. And I think that emotion and that passion is really what's driving that work from our advocacy and patient community. So Matt, or actually Phil or Matt, who would like to go first given where we are with our um, technical uh, situation? What works best? Andy, this is Phil. I think um, I'm gonna I'm gonna present the first set of slides, and then Matt's gonna take over from there. Fantastic. I'm glad we're going with the plan. So thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, please move ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I am flying blind here, but I have my set of slides. So um, hopefully, if I could just get confirmed that slide one is uh, showing a nice graphic of the human GI tract, and it has uh, Matt and my um, information on the left-hand side. Are we good with that? You got it. Okay. Sure are. So. Um, uh, I want to thank the Fight CRC meeting organizers for inviting us to speak to you all today. Um, 
I realize this audience has a broad interest in all aspects of colon cancer research and treatment, um, but as Andy mentioned today, we're going to uh, focus our talks today on early onset colon cancer and tell you about some of the plans that NCI has developed to help support research uh, to combat this disease. Next slide two, please. So, um, oh, we have to start with a disclaimer. Um, so first, well, Dr. Young and I have no potential financial conflicts to report. I do need to say that our information presented today does not constitute official NCI policy. Uh, next slide, please, three. So um, our talks are gonna be divided up into two halves. Um, First, I will cover some of the information we have on early onset colon cancer and what it is, and some ideas for uh, what we think may be causing the increase in its incidence. And then in his talk, Matt will cover information on the detection and screening of early onset colorectal cancer and some of the plans we have for moving the research forward. And I do want to say also that as I'm speaking, if anyone has any questions, I'm not sure how this is going to work with the technical problems we're having, um, but please jump in and ask any questions and, and we'll stop and field those as we go. Okay, um, I should also start by saying that, that we recognize early onset colon cancer is a big problem and that it can really strike anybody, and, and including um, Andy's direct uh, family uh, uh, experience with the disease. Um, just in the news today in, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, one of the uh, Baltimore Orioles star players, Trey Mancini, who's 27 years old, um, it was reported is now being treated for colon cancer. So really, it's a, it's a disease we should all be paying attention to. Uh, next slide four, please. So one of the big questions facing scientists who research colon cancer is uh, the fact that cases of early onset disease in the U.S. and in Western Europe are increasing. Um, I should mention that we're defining early onset colon cancer as sporadic cases that are diagnosed before the age of 50. So these are not cases that are associated with what we call germline mutations or familial syndromes like Lynch syndrome. Um, there, the genetic causality of the cancer is well known. Um, so these are not sporadic disease and those genetic causes are not rising in incidence. Um, so the increasing cases of, of early onset disease are represented in um, this figure from a 2017 report um, in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute that came from Rebecca Siegel and her colleagues at the American Cancer Society. If you look um, at the right-hand side uh, graph, um, the scientists, what they did in the paper was analyze several decades worth of data on colon cancer and they found um, this alarming rise in cases of early onset disease. Um, these cases of sporadic disease have risen by more than 50% since 1994, um, as hopefully you can all see on, on the arrow there. They found these increases are occurring both in men and in women, and it's occurring at a time when actually the overall rates for colon cancer have been falling for some time, and that is seen clearly on the graph on the left. Um, next slide, number five, please. So when these increases are viewed from a birth cohort perspective, um, the data show that the increased risk of early onset colon cancer is actually accelerating or seems to be accelerating. And that's measured by a year over year increase in the annual percent change um, as cases uh, of cases in, at younger ages, and that's seen in figure uh, graph A of the figure, where you can see in the 20s and 30s, the, the annual percent change is about 2 to 4%. Um, when you get to about age 50, the, uh, the uh, increase has actually, actually become a decrease, and you're actually um, um, decreasing um, in risk. Um, so, uh, the study also um, compared uh, in the right-hand side of the graph, figure B, um, 
So compared to people born around 1950, which is the low spot on the graph, those born in 1990 or now have about double the risk of early onset colon cancer and quadruple the risk of rectal cancer. Since the genetics of early onset disease um, don't appear to be distinct from normal onset, um, that is, there's, there's not a different set of mutations in the cancers, the birth cohort effects suggest that changes in early life exposures to known or unknown risk factors for colon cancer may be what's driving the increase in risk of early onset disease. Um, and, and that's just graphically, um, the, the text in the box on the right um, tells us that. Um, so following the, the 2017 report from um, Siegel and colleagues, um, next slide please, number six. Um, following that report, the NCI helped to organize or participate in a number of meetings um, discussing um, early onset colon cancer. Um, two of the key meetings include the December 2017 um, National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable meeting that was held in Bethesda, Maryland, and then the February 2019 Fight CRC workshop that was held in Denver, Colorado. These meetings brought together um, a group of national experts on colon cancer, and that provided us with some very important feedback and a great overview of the state of the science related to early onset colon cancer. The information also helped us to define what are the knowledge and resource gaps in the field that need to be bridged before we can move the research forward. And the, the roundtable and uh, Fight CRC meeting also made some specific recommendations for developing a strategic plan of action that we hope will accelerate research discoveries for new treatments of the disease. Next slide seven, please. So one important step in developing that plan of action um, was getting the information out to the scientific community, and that was done by publishing the workshop report in the journal Gastroenterology last year. Um, a couple of the key recommendations from the report um, were, and now looking under recommendations, the first red arrow. Um, the first recommendation um, highlighted was to um, support additional research on early onset colon cancer through focused funding opportunities. And my colleague Matt Young will tell you more about um, those plans in his presentation. Then the second highlighted recommendation um, was that um, we should be considering new risk factors for what might be um, causing the increase in early onset cases. So um, a lot of time was spent at, at both of these meetings discussing the types of risk factors, um, and, and I'd like to show you what, what kind of risk factors we're talking about. So next slide eight, please. Um, several studies um, have looked at different environmental or behavioral risk factors that are known to affect colon cancer risk overall. So um, looking at the top box on, on this graphic, um, changes in exposures to things, um, to, to different factors were measured in data from two large national population health surveys. Um, and these surveys found that risk factor exposure um, by birth cohort, again, or by age, to things like genetic susceptibilities, physical inactivity, or alcohol consumption, those risks have not changed much since um, going all the way back to the 1960s. Um, the middle box, so things like smoking and aspirin use have actually been decreasing among the young um, since about the 1970s. However, there were several known risk factors for colon cancer that show a coincident rise along with the cases of early onset disease. So these risk factors uh, have kind of moved up to the top of our list of exposures that might be contributing to um, the increase in early onset cases. And those risk factors include those in the box down at the bottom, um, things like increases in obesity rates in the U.S., um, TD2 is type 2 diabetes, and um, prediabetes metabolic disease have been increasing along with cases of early onset colon cancer, as has antibiotic use, especially early in childhood, and then changes in our diet, such as a level of meat consumption and food additives. Next slide, please. Number nine. Um, it was striking.
striking to those of us at the meeting, at least, that these coincidentally rising risk factors are all known to directly impact lifetime changes in the gastrointestinal microbiome. So microbiome has been in the news quite a bit the last few years, um, and we think this connection between um, the populations and types of bacteria and other microbes too that all that live in all of our, our GI tracts that that these connections to um, or associations to early onset colorectal cancer might be very fertile ground for investigators to explore. Uh, next slide ten, please. So as, as we went through the meeting, um, we, we developed some ideas, um, and this graphic just shows an overview of how those major coincident risk factors might be interacting with each other and with host factors, um, which is a term we describe as, if you look all the way to the left on that graphic in the, the fuchsia colored box, we describe these as gene environment interactions. Um, so we know that things like diet, obesity, bacteria, and antibiotic, the yellow boxes on the figure, can all affect how our genes are regulated. But we don't know if and how those are contributing to, um, to um, risk of early onset colon cancer. Um, in our discussions, we tried to capture some of the contextual elements of these interactions. That, that is including um, temporal effects of exposure, which are the green boxes. So what we're interested there is, does it make any difference if you're exposed to a given risk factor early in life, early in childhood, or, or in adolescence, or, or later in life? Um, we also um, wanted to look at any disparities in the demographics of exposure. So that's the orange boxes on the figure. Um, and those include things like differences in geography or uh, race and ethnicity, because that could give us some clues as to what's going on. Um, with the increasing incidence. And of course, we need to consider all of this and how it's interacting with the patient's genetic, the patient's genetics. Um, and, and those interactions could really um, affect um, different treatment options that might be given to a given patient. So obviously, it's a complex problem. Um, and that it will take a lot more research to solve these problems, but, but this kind of a graphic just gives you an idea of the framework of, of the different kinds of things that, that um, we think are, are really important for investigators to look at. Uh, next slide 11, please. So with that, I think I'll stop um, and take any questions you might have before I turn over the rest of the presentation to my colleague, Matt Young. Great, Phil. That was uh, fantastic. And thank you again for highlighting a lot of the work that's been done in the field and without the support of many of our partners wouldn't have been possible. But I do think that it represents, again, um, many organizations and uh, international and national perspective. So, Phil, we have a question right now. I know that you talked about the cohort effect. Um, if you were going to talk a little bit about what that means, particularly um, from what we know around that age group, um, that specific cohort, and then what we might see in the future based on some of the trends for even very young below that 50. Can you talk a little bit about what that cohort effect is and how that's helping provide insight about the future direction of research? Sure. Um, so just just subdivide when you're looking at large populations and these national health surveys, um, some of them have been tracking people and their health for over 30 years, over 50,000 people. So over the course of time, um, some of those folks have developed colon cancers and, and at different ages. So it's it's convenient for us to group um, cohorts, um, and in this case by age. So it might be by decade, those born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And as you look at the data when it's broken down like that, you could, you could see in that first graphic that I showed that incidence rates for the early onset cases were actually increasing. So it gives us a clue, uh, or, or really that's the, the chief discovery, is these cases are actually increasing. And it was strange to see that um, based on the fact that we know overall rates in the country have been going down for some time. So we don't think human genetics have changed much over the last 40 years. Um, so those those um, cohort effects give us um, 
kind of guidance as to where we should be looking. What have these folks that are in the um, in the uh, younger cohorts been exposed to that folks in the older cohort may not have been? Great. And I think that's a, um, a really nice um, entree into punting to Matt. I know that we're a little behind schedule today, but we're going to go ahead and save some of the additional questions for after Dr. Young's presentation. But Phil, thank you so much for framing um, that the issue and talking about all of the great um, research and what are the strategies that we're considering. Because I do think a number of survivors, advocates, and folks have really questioned why are we seeing um, this sort of increase? I think, Phil, as you noted, human genetics in the last 50 years, 25 years, hasn't ne haven't necessarily seen an evolution, but we really have to get to the bottom of it. So thank you so much. So Matt, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and we'll go to the second part and we'll open it up for larger discussion at the end. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. Thank you, Phil, for your uh, introductions. So I'm gonna talk today about um, more about what's going on in the clinic. Um, so uh, as Andy said, I, I'm working at the, the Division of Cancer Prevention and we're looking at early, early diagnosis of uh, cancers, which would also include uh, early onset colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. So uh, many of you probably know a lot of what's, what's actually available in the clinic or uh, possibly more likely not available. Uh, so we can break down the clinical side of early onset colorectal cancer into uh, prevention uh, screening and intervention and treatments. Uh, currently, we don't have any, um, any recommendations uh, for cancer prevention uh, or for cancer screening. Uh, what and treatments, what we have is the, um, the clinical guidelines do not consider early age colorectal cancer as a, a criteria to drive treatment. To, uh, basically, that what we're looking at is therapeutic options for early and late colorectal cancer are the same according to the major oncological societies. And the recommendations for more aggressive surgical or ad adjunctive approaches for early onset colorectal patients. Uh, at this time, it's thought lead to over, over treatment. So right now, we're not, there's, there are no recommendations that differ from uh, late onset colorectal cancer. For, for cancer prevention, uh, it's very similar. Uh, what we know that prevent cancer will be the same uh, for early onset colorectal cancer, as for, as for late onset, uh, eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. Drink, uh, don't drink alcohol or drink very little. Stop smoking. Exercise more often. Um, maintain a healthy weight. This hasn't changed uh, for, for early onset. There may be new new recommendations for prevention coming, but until we have further research, uh, there's no nothing outstanding that would be different than late onset. Similar in the screening mechanisms, there are no screening or early detection for early onset colorectal cancers. Uh, the, 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 the symptoms are the same and patients should be aware of the symptoms and that's what's leading to patients seeing their doctor. Uh, obviously, you know the symptoms, the painless bleeding, or persistent change in, in uh, bowel habits, uh, ab abdominal discomfort, uh, weakness, fatigue, and, and other. So uh, again, the same symptoms that adults, uh, late onsets would have. So, so until we know more, uh, there's nothing that's uh, for early screening that, that's out there available. Next slide, please. Clearly, early cancer detection saves lives. Most cancers are diagnosed when they are large size. Uh, this means they most likely have already metastasized, which means treating it is much harder uh, and more complicated. So to reduce cancer-specific mortality, we need effective biomarkers or other methods to assess uh, risk assessments for early detections and for the, the therapeutic aspects of it. 
Uh, next slide, please. So in, in cancer prevention, uh, we, we have set up the Early Detection Research Network. This was established 20 years ago, and it's focused solely on developing biomarkers for early detection and risk prevention. prevention. Uh, it provides guidelines on validations and reference samples. It's unparalleled, unparalleled, full, fully operational and open access. So all can, can join or view what's going on. Uh, and we have strong scientific collaborations. Next slide, please. So can we develop biomarkers for early detection for early onset colorectal cancer? Or can we use the biomarkers that are currently available for late onset colorectal cancer for early onset disease? Next slide, please. These are the current biomarkers uh, that are available for late onset. Um, many of you should know these. Uh, the, the fit, the, the, the top four uh, are um, stool based, the top three are stool based markers. And the, the fourth one is a, a blood based marker. These are clinically uh, available, FDA approved tests that you can receive from your physicians uh, in, in for the early for the early detection of late onset colorectal cancer. This the sensitivity of these assays that is determines how well they they detect colon cancer and the specificity and shows how how often that they will get it correct or not have a false negative. Uh, the, the top four are, these are tests that will, a positive will lead to colonoscopy, where the colonoscopy is considered the gold standard, which most uh, is the optimal assay to see. Uh, the NCI doesn't recommend, or may, let me rephrase, the, the NCI does not endorse any uh, any of these methods over any of the other ones. Uh, this is a call for your physician that you should make on your own. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So biomarkers for early detection require a high, a high um, sensitivity and a high specificity. So the high sensitivity gives, is what we call true positive. Uh, it's needed to reduce the false negatives. And the high specificity is we call a true negative and is used to reduce the false positives. For colon cancer, the colonoscopy is the gold standard and the standard of care used for screening in adults over 45. So you can go to your doctor and you can ask for a colonoscopy if you're over 45. Uh, biomarkers that the biomarkers that I showed in the previous slide, which were discovered and validated, were all verified by colonoscopy. For the false negatives that uh, that these markers may have, will will lead to a misdiagnosis, which is often detected within the next two or three years when the next time for the screening uh, of those markers. The false positives will lead to uh, unnecessary colonoscopy, which is, uh, which is the standard of care. So that's acceptable at this time. Next slide. Uh, biomarkers to test for early detection. These are the FDA requirements for a biomarker. Um, the, the assay has to work analytically. It has to also work in the clinics very well. These are easy. Uh, as, as shown with the, the, the markers we already have. Uh, the benefit, the fact that the benefits out, have to outweigh the risk is what is limiting our ability to put biomarkers for early onset colorectal cancer. The, the fact that we cannot overdiagnose people uh, and, and induce them to unnecessary colonoscopy drives the, the risk of these markers and show the specificity has to be much higher. Next slide, please. 
other biomarkers that are currently being looked at uh, by the industry, uh, liquid bio biopsies offer the potential for a multi-cancer biomarkers. Multi-cancer biomarkers, uh, these are, they will, they're designed to, to test, to detect multiple cancers. The idea with these is the sensitivity and the specificity are driven by one or one or two of the other cancers that they will detect, but and allows us to approve them before they uh, for multiple cancers, and allowing a lower level of sensitivity for some of the secondary cancers. Uh, many of these are next gen sequencing type assays. They all have colon cancer in them, uh, and, and likely. Uh, could possibly become markers for early detection. Next slide, please. We're also seeing companies move into detecting microbiome to predict colon cancer. Uh, there's this persistent medicine has a, uh, an FDA device, FDA approved device, a non-invasive invasive collection swab that's used to collect the microbiome. Uh, they use artificial intelligence to analyze this data, and it, it's the beginning of understanding the microbiome and its role in, in driving colon cancer and possibly early onset cancer. Next slide, please. So lastly, I'd like to talk about funding opportunities uh, that the NCI has, as Phil indicated early on. Um, we, we currently have a provocative question now. Provocative question one seeks applications that are that investigate the etiology functions responsible for alarming increase in sporadic early onset cancers. Um, this, this, as Phil said, this this question has been driven by the interest in advocacies and others for the alarming rise uh, in early colorectal cancer as well as some other cancers. Uh, the, R, the, the, um, the RFAs or the, the funding opportunity numbers are listed here. Uh, next slide, please. Other funding opportunities that are available include funding under the um, Cancer Health Disparities Group, which clearly early onset colorectal cancer falls in a health disparity area. Uh, also, we have multiple fundings for microbiome specific funding. Uh, again, these are not specific for early onset colon cancer, but they fall under the, the age, the uh, ability to look at these areas. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to present some of the uh, what what we can do now uh, or what can be done now and so education of patients and medical staff is a, uh, a start to how we can reduce the mortality for early onset colon cancer, uh, educate the patient and medical staff to the risk factors and the early symptoms of colorectal cancer in our young adults are that are is we need to educate them that this is a real problem. Understanding the risk, as we Phil pointed out earlier, obesity, inactivity, consumption of red meat, inflammation, hereditary syndromes, uh, and understanding the symptoms, uh, the painless bleeding, the persistent change in valve. All of this needs to be made aware to our younger population that not to ignore this or not to think that this will get better. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the, the constant ads from Colgard uh, pushing their new product for, for uh, cancer, for, early, for detection of cancer or colorectal cancer. This has driven the production or the use of this, this um, marker. Similar uh, advertisement could make people aware of what's going on. And when they go into their doctor, they, they would not be afraid of asking. Again, this, this are not, this is my opinion and, and not necessarily the endorsement of the NCI. Uh, uh, last slide. 
So this will lead us, this will end my talk and open us back up for discussion, for questions. Great. Um, thank you, Matt, for actually continuing to expand out on the discussion about the clinical implications, um, types of screening modalities, as well as thinking about uh, the biomarkers and different types of opportunities to um, understand the diagnoses and more about early age onset disease. And I think, um, Matt, you opened by saying a few words about um, the differences of what we know and what we don't know about early age onset disease. But reiterating that fact, I know there's been some discussion about whether um, a diagnosis of someone who's in their 20s as opposed to someone um, or a group of folks who are in their 60s, is the cancer different biologically? And so I think going back to that um, slide of, of talking about those molecular difference, are we seeing different types of cancers between the young um, diagnoses and those who have a definitive diagnosis as well as maybe people who are over the age of 50? There, there are some data that says there's a difference in the types of cancer. It, it may be more, uh, there may be more of one type in the younger adults that it's there, it is present in the older adults, but the, the, the trend may be more to a, a certain mutation, a BRAF mutation versus a RAS mutation. Uh, so, so that's probably the main interest the difference. There, other differences are subtle and I don't think there's really enough cases to drive um, a treatment or a uh, early marker that would be different than what we use for, um, for late onset. Once, okay, we find, once we find differences that could allow um, targeted therapy to, to be applied, but that would be more of a case by case study. Right, exactly, uh, and, but definitely an area of potential, which I think it's fantastic that you brought up um, the provocative research question and uh, huge kudos to um, the NCI for being responsive to the advocacy and scientific community and opening up early age onset as a specific study. Um, let me just ask both of you right now in terms of looking at this, because I think Matt and Phil, you both um, had referenced on some level um, or, Colorectal cancer isn't the only type of um, disease where we're seeing an uptick in uh, the number of diagnoses um, in people younger than we would expect to see. Is there anything that we think that we can learn from the other cancer types or opportunities to study in parallel um, right now based on this trends that we're seeing in increased incidence in several cancer types? So I, I'll jump and in that, that yeah, uh, I do think there's an opportunity to understand where the difference or similarities may be. Uh, some think that this may just be a shift in, in the age that we're shift, shifting down to both uh, younger, for both all types of cancer into a younger age. Uh, that could easily be seen if we have similar markers or similar drivers as we call them, uh, in, in the uh, different types of cancer. So clearly by studying uh, the, the field, we may learn more quicker. Okay, great. So uh, any, uh, sure. I'll, I'll just jump in with an additional comment. Um, uh, Matt's right, I think uh, it's a great question about whether other types of cancer are increasing um, in, in early onset. And there are only a few um, that, that we know of, um, certain subtypes of breast cancer um, and stomach cancer along with colon cancer seem to be trending younger. Um, we don't know the reasons for this, but it would be valuable to do the kind of comparative analysis between those different cancer types to see if, as Matt suggested, there are some commonalities between them. But it's a, it's a question we simply don't know the answer to at this point. Great. And I do think, again, that provocative research um, proposal is going to give some fantastic um, discussion and uh, possible opportunities to research both the items that we've just asked questions about. Um, so, Phil, let me go back to you. And I think there are some questions, uh, particularly as you showed the schematic. Um, and again, um, that schematic specifically came out of a meeting in Denver with about 45 folks sitting in the room thinking about what were the times of exposure, the types of uh, factors that could be um, 
part of risks and exposures, um, different types of opportunities and the like. Um, so Phil, we talked about some of the um, usual suspects, new players um, in the types of causation and things we think might be there. I think one of um, the folks uh, in the audience had said, are we sure that that's the entire list? Um, are there other things that are out there? Um, so I, I want to say that, you know, some of this, as pointed out, came out of meetings um, where we were looking at the priority factors and the like. But I think, Matt, you did a great job of talking about there are things we do know about, for instance, process meat, um, some of the inactivity, um, obesity and the like that are known factors. But I guess, Phil, do you think that that's the exhaustive list of things that really could be contributing or do we not know? How would you respond to that schematic that you showed? Um, well, and then what else might you and um, one that, that was considered among the, the gathered experts, I'm sure it is not an exhaustive list. And there were some other ideas that were put out there. Everything, exposure to microplastics in the water, um, exposure, or, or this idea of, of um, you know, smaller nuclear families. So um, sometimes there's a uh, immune benefit from having been raised in a large family. All of these things were were considered. Um, so, so I think it's absolutely true that there's no way even a room full of experts can cover everything that might be contributing to early onset disease. What we're hoping is, um, as the um, as the provocative questions and other funding opportunities are published, that the investigators who are sitting in their their labs um, may have knowledge of some other exposure or may be observing some local population. With, with a spike in early onset cases and investigate those those connections. So, so I would think that there are other things that may be contributing that we simply are not aware of um, and we would really like to know about those. So we're hoping that investigator-initiated um, um, proposals might start to investigate some of these um, unidentified risk factors. Okay, so wonderful. I'd so like to, those at home, I'd also like to point out on. that um, it, it's probably not just one um, component. It's probably a combination of multiple components. So it, it's and it's not going to be a simple uh, find to find out which one is the the causative agent. So so we have some ways to go for that point. Good. Um, so I've got some notes that we need to wrap this up in the next five minutes. Um, so we are going to have to do this and I know I'm getting questions rolling in left and right. So I do want to go back to the screening discussion. Um, there are some um, thoughts and criticisms that some of the tests that are being used or could be used as frontline tests uh, maybe aren't being used as readily because we might see a lot of false positives. Um, and then I think building upon that, the question is, are there types of screening tests um, that we think could be used in the future to detect early age onset disease or a type of physical exam that might be specific to the very young population. So I'll let you both unpack that question and we'll probably entertain one more and call it good. So, so I'll start with the, the screening, uh, using the current ones to bring it down to a younger population. And in fact, the American Cancer Society uh, at a meeting with the FDA and the uh, Academy, the uh, National Academy, has actually suggested that we look into this, uh, uh, lowering the age or testing these these current markers uh, in a younger population. This is probably the best, fastest way to begin uh, because they're already FDA approved. Uh, the The concern is if you have a positive test, you have to have a a uh, an outcome or something, a response to that positive test, which would mean the colonoscopy. So, so we have to get to the point where we, the insurance companies are going to pay or someone is going to cover the cost of a colonoscopy. So, so those tests are also for non-symptomatic patients. They won't work. In, they're, they're not approved to, to use in people that come to the to the doctor's office and say, I have blood in my stool. So, so that would currently lead to a colonoscopy. So education of the doctors that are younger than 45 person with blood in his stool needs a colonoscopy. It, it should be the first key uh, element to do. 
Okay, great. Phil, anything to add? No, no, I defer to Matt's expertise on, on screening and detection. Wonderful. Um, and to that, I'm going to have um, one more specific question. Um, so Dr. Guru um, presented data at ASCO last year that I think was really um, validating what a lot of patients and, and folks have felt that there is oftentimes mixed diagnosis, delay in diagnosis. And in Dr. Guru's study, he showed it was almost 290 days from the time someone presented with symptoms to tell the time they actually received a formal and accurate di uh, diagnosis of colorectal cancer. Um, so I guess, um, you know, Matt, you've done a nice job of laying out what patients should know um, about the signs and symptoms. Just a quick note um, or shout out about sometimes what are considered um, uh, signs and symptoms that aren't connected or related to onset or people who have my, uh, misdiagnosis. Um, can you fellas share a little bit about also the provider community being responsive to these um, signs, symptoms, and patients presenting? Uh, the provider communities, you mean healthcare, the doctors and the nurses and the clinics. The, that's, Correct. to me, a, a lot of the education needs to go uh, because often they don't believe um, this is a problem at a younger age. And, and so uh, by educating our healthcare system that not to ignore these symptoms uh, and to, to be proactive. Uh, I'm not an MD, so I can't suggest or recommend what needs to be done, but maybe a group of MDs uh, needs to get together and decide and set up a recommendations or, or for what to do when a patient comes in with um, pain in their stomach. Uh, with the current mm -hmm. healthcare being mostly digitized now, uh, it could be easily a red flag in the computer system that says you should follow this patient on a weekly basis or you should recommend a colonoscopy or you should s send up to a, a gastroenterologist. Uh, these these are the, the mechanisms that are being used for other uh, symptoms of other diseases that need the primary physician to flag them to move them to the next stage. Wonderful. And I do know that um, many of our partners with the National Colorectal Roundtable, as well as um, clinical and public health partners, are working on this. And I think um, Dr. Dennis Sonnen, who's been a um, sage, I think, in the work we've done, and um, sent a really nice uh, message thinking about early Johnson disease in the study that no matter what we find out from these trials, um, we've got to be ready to do something about um, that work because we already know about family history. We know about many of the risk factors that were noted, but we're not doing an amazing job of educating or the patient or the provider and we need to make more of an effort. So I think that um, is definitely uh, coincides uh, Matt, with the, the messages that you've been putting forward as well. Um, to wrap this panel up, um, I do want to just tell everyone, and I'm going to have one final question for Matt and Phil, uh, but just remind folks that if you didn't get your question answered or have an additional question, please email it to advocate at fightcrc.org. That's advocate at fightcrc.org. Um, and this is one of many conversations that we've convened or will continue, continue to convene with the patient um, and the provider community. So we're excited uh, to have both of these individuals who've put a lot of time and energy working alongside us. And I can't say how um, excited and how honored that I, it's, I've been as well as the organization to really have you guys in step with the great work as well as the Office of Advocacy. So I'm gonna start with you, Phil, and this is our final question. Um, this was one of the first questions I received, but it's I think a good way to round us out. We know research is being done, we know it takes time, but what can advocates do now to help research and or get the message out? So Phil, what would you say? Um, first of all, thank you for the kind words and it's, it's been a real pleasure working with Fight CRC to really um, help us develop um, some, some plans of action to go forward with this. Uh, advocates do play a role in, in um, NIH um, activities. Um, we have an office for uh, uh, advocacy um, which um, can place advocates on things like um, um, review panels for grants as well as at um, NCI-sponsored 
and professional society sponsored meetings. And I think it's important for advocates to attend those meetings, voice your concerns. I'm always amazed at how well educated um, patients and, and survivors are. And you can tell us a lot about quality of life issues, survivorship issues, um, and and I think just uh, general general uh, um, medical care issues that otherwise wouldn't necessarily come to light in things like a clinical trial. There, they're looking at hard numbers um, and and biological outcomes, molecular outcomes. But I think it's very important for patients and advocates to um, be able to tell us um, other experiences because that also will will give it more information on on clinical annotations of the disease. Always helps us to figure out what else might be going on and and. It's hard to know what's important and what's not, but to have the information I think is key and, and the patients and advocates are the only ones that can provide that. Wonderful. And Matt, the final word. Oh, I get the final word. Um, I, I agree with, with um, what Phil said and I believe this organization has, um, has got the ball rolling and, and is really motivating a lot of people into looking at this. Uh, clearly, this is a, a concerning issue that needs attention, and the sooner we put our attention to it, uh, the, the quicker we can, can have some response and, and possibly a, a corrective effect. Awesome. Well, thank you, um, gentlemen, so much for being on today and sharing. Um, again, I've had the great honor um, over the last year, and I just want to say that I feel like for anything throughout the course of my career that I've worked on, I've never seen um, a group of people be so responsive, nimble. Um, I don't know that the advocacy community gets to see this on the daily basis, but I do. And to be able to see a working group that um, you guys have helped us and really people have um, rallied behind because you are at the table. We're almost at 100 strong internationally. Um, we'll either be in Spain with additional 20 countries there talking about how to build off that schematic that we've all seen today and further that advancement in that research, or we'll be online doing that with maybe more than 20 or 30 countries on. But we couldn't have done that without the support um, and the leadership and noting that NCI, DOD, ACS, CDC, and many of our great partners were, were behind us. And I think to go full circle, Molly talked today a lot about the legislative asks. She talked about the funding, the policy, um, we saw the amount that's being funded right now, but we also know that a lot of the money and support that's now moving this ahead, um, as well as the future, is going to rely on the advocate voice, I think, as both of you had talked about, um, to continue to ask for this dedicated funding because this is a really global health issue um, and we must address it. So the advocates on the Hill, um, everyone really thinking this through and making this clear to your legislators at home and at the, in our nation's capital is key because without those resources, we couldn't do this great work. Um, so again, a huge thanks to all of our friends um, who've been engaged in all of our great work. And I'm going to um, send it off to our larger team to wrap us up for the day. Great. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking with us and, and bearing with us through technical delays and all that. But a real thank you to Matt and Phil and Andy. Um, there's so much great work happening, and we're so grateful that they could join us on a Sunday to, to talk about the things that they're working on and, and take our questions. So that wraps up our panel discussion for today. But Virtual Call in Congress 2020 is not over yet. Um, and as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to really thank you all for your patience and flexibility. Um, a week ago, this was going to be an in-person event, and um, you all have really rolled with us and, and bared with us um, as we transitioned this to a virtual event and, and dealt with all the technology issues that come along with that. So thank you so much for continuing to support us and, and participating. Um, I also want to give a huge shout out to the entire Fight CRC, Fight CRC staff, um, in particular Aubrey and Nancy who are here in DC with me, um, but and the entire team um, who is online and has been helping us with questions and again it was a really big effort with a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get this pulled off um, in a week and we couldn't have done it without our amazing team and, and we just feel really lucky to be able to, to work with everyone. 
Um, I also want to shout out to our board for their support and encouragement um, throughout this whole process. Um, also our GAC, our Grassroots um, Advocacy Committee, um, and the Fight CRC ambassadors who jumped in from the beginning and helped to build an excitement on social media and um, get the word out about the change. We, we really couldn't do it, um, what we do without you guys. Um, and finally, last but certainly not least, I want to thank Brendan and our whole live stream team. If you could, could see here in the room, we've got this incredible setup, and um, I don't know how any of it works, but they've made it work, and so we're so grateful to them. Um, and, um, you know, big virtual round of applause um, to them and the rest of the team. Um, and so, you know, even though our speaker portion is over, that doesn't mean we're done for the day. Um, obviously, one of the best parts of Call on Congress is um, the time when we can get together and share our stories. It's always incredibly powerful and, um, and, and emotional and just a really great way for um, everyone to connect with the rest of the Fight CRC family. Um, about what they're going through. So um, this afternoon, for the rest of the day, we would encourage you to share your story on social media. Um, you can record a video of yourself. Um, if I can do it here, you guys can do it into your phone. Um, you can post a strong arm selfie, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. But I think it would be a great way to help us connect with each other, um, even though, even while we're practicing our, our social distancing. Um, and so be sure to tag um, at FightCRC and again use the hashtag um, CONC2020 so that we can see all of your amazing stories and um, you know get to know the folks um, that we haven't had a chance to get to know yet. Um, and again, as a reminder, tomorrow we hit the hill virtually. Um, and again, our goal is to send 5,000 emails to members of Congress in support of funding for colorectal cancer research um, and prevention. So again, this is a bold goal, but we feel um, you know, strongly that this is something that the colorectal cancer community can get behind and, and that we can reach and we can really show um, just how strong and, and relentless we are. Um, so keep an eye on your inboxes. You'll be getting emails tomorrow um, with more information about that. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to send us off. Um, we have a brief message from our president, Angie Davis, um, about her sharing her story and what Colin Congress and, and this community has meant to her. So again, thanks everyone. This call on Congress, this is a fight that has to continue because for us to have a future without colorectal cancer, we have to put in the work now. Your members need to hear your story and it is powerful. They're going to change their vote because of your story. They're going to change their vote and support because of you. Our members of Congress are put into office by us and we are exercising our right to tell them what is important to us. If we don't do that, if we don't tell them what we value, they're not gonna change their vote. They're gonna go with who is loud enough to say this is dang important. Because my life rests on this. I need you to invest in research because I'm waiting for a cure. And you should be comfortable telling that to them. They work for you. So that's what I really wanna tell you. Every single person in this room, if you've been here 10 times, if you've been here for your very first time, they work for you. They owe you the time to listen to you.